Amen, amen, and thank you for joining us for worship this morning from all over the world. God First Community Second, and we are Third Presbyterian Church. We have a great worship plan today, but as we prepare, I want you to think about this. Now, we have heard this world is not our home for the Christian. We are citizens of heaven. And I think we hear that, but do we really receive what that means for us, how we're to act and react in this land we presently dwell. That was once our home, but now it's a foreign land because for the Christian, our citizenship has been changed to heaven. But too many have fallen in line with the adage, while in Rome, do as the Romans do. But the fact is we're not Romans. And if we are in Rome, we can't achieve victory in Rome until we recognize who we are, whose we are, and more importantly, where we are from meaning our citizenship. Today, we'll explore our heavenly citizenship in this sermon titled, What Does Your Passport Say? Let us continue our worship today in song. Thank you again for joining us. Amen. Amen. Today, we finish the third chapter of our study in Philippians, beginning at verse 12. Hear these words. Not that I've already attained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, to that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my examples, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now I say again, even with tears, uh, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is in their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power enables us to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Amen. And I want to use for a subject today, what does your passport say? What does your passport say? You know, as I read this portion of the letter, there was a visceral reaction uh, in me where I could almost hear Paul as if he was preaching this letter would be shouting, I press, forgetting what is behind me, I press on. And you need to press on too. Follow me as I follow God. I have gave you an example, so why don't you follow it? I can't live your life for you. You have to take hold of it in the name of Jesus. Quit trying to be like this world. This is not your home any longer, so act like you are a visitor or at work. Don't get too comfortable on this earth, but eagerly await the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I imagine the ink on the parchment paper on which Paul was writing was a little bit darker because I, I can just feel him pressing a little harder to make this text bold to to translate the emotion to which he was writing this portion of the letter. And I want, I, I want to, to see today if we too can receive all of what Paul was trying to convey in this portion of the letter. So Paul continues this letter to the Philippians in this third chapter, encouraging them to live up to what has already been attained. And this portion of the letter is, is, is exclaiming the command found in Psalms 107 and 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Their salvation through their acceptance 
of the sacrifice in Jesus has them on the path of eternal life in heaven. They are now citizens of heaven. And Paul stresses that they live up to this citizenship. The good news this morning is that we have a new citizenship. We are in Christ. And because we are in Christ, we are seated in the heavenly places with him. Our citizenship is definite. And yes, there will be a physical transition when we die. But spiritually, we are there already. We belong there. What then does this citizenship in heaven mean? Why, why does Paul use this term to describe the Christian? I think it's to illuminate a contrast, a contrast between the Christian and non-Christian, the believer and unbeliever, the saved and the unsaved. Because you see, when we look with the eyes of the flesh to compare ourselves as Christians with those who are not, there, there's only the ability to see the fleshly differences. So beyond the physical differences, we, we might see some behavioral differences pertaining to our church habits, maybe, or something to that nature. But the Christian lives in a spiritual realm, thus has their citizenship there. And, and in this spiritual realm, there is an infinite difference between citizens of heaven and citizens of this world. And until the Christian acknowledges those differences, receives those differences, they will have no power nor incentive to behave other than a person with worldly citizenship. Again, what does your passport say? What does your passport say? Have you looked at it lately? Do you know what it means? Because if you're saved, it no longer says citizen of this world, but it has been upgraded. For those who are saved, your passport now says citizen of heaven. And maybe the reason why so many Christians are acting like this world is because they have forgotten what their passport says or may assume that it says something different than it actually says. Listen, when a person is in their, their homeland or home country, there is no need to walk around with their passport because why they're at home. So generally at home, people will store their passports away because the assumption is that you are a citizen of this country and people don't think about their passport and, and they just comfortably move around. Why? Because again, they're at home but when it's time to travel outside of their home country. The first thing they need is the passport, not so much to leave or exit the country, but more importantly, so they can get back into the home country. Because the last thing you want is to be trapped in a foreign land and not be able to get back home. So while in that foreign land, you keep your passport close and you never lose sight of it. Why? Because it claims your citizenship. And trust me, you're quick to let people know that, look, I'm just here for a short time, whether on business or vacation or what have you. But I am not of this land. I am a proud citizen of this country. Because that's where my home is. Church, for those of us who are saved, we ought to carry around our spiritual passports and carry them close. Because according to Paul this morning, we are in a foreign land. This is not our home. And the last thing we want to get is trapped in this foreign land. <laughs> that was a good place for an amen. So, so we ought to keep our passports close. We got to look at it, understand what it means, because understanding our heavenly passport will dictate how we act, how we react, how we operate and work in this foreign land of this world. I want you to pay attention to Paul's comment here. He says, our citizenship is heaven. Now, we may have brushed right by that, but he says our citizenship is heaven. Not will be, not someday in the future, but the present tense as to say right now you are citizens of heaven. 
It's not a future thing that we look forward to. It's not a, a state or a status that we hope to attain, but it's ours right now. You see, I just said something right there. And I hope you didn't miss it. Because so many are trying to prepare themselves to be citizens of heaven without realizing what your passport says that you're a citizen already. Colossians 1 and 13, it says, we have been delivered from the dominion of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Colossians 3 and 1 says, as believers in Christ, we are raised up with Christ. And finally, Ephesians 2 and 6, it says we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our current full citizenship in heaven. See, this is a very sound New Testament truth. And we must begin to understand and believe in our hearts that, that we are now as fully accepted and established by God in God's heavenly home. If we're ever to function uh, effectively and victoriously as God's ambassadors in this present evil age, we must receive this truth that God's home is our home. And in order to help us understand and appreciate what our passport says, I, I want us to look today at, at the characteristics of the kingdom to which we belong as citizens and contrast that to the kingdom of this world and understand the great disparity between the two so that we can fully realize and appreciate what our passport says. Now, the characteristic of any kingdom is what the king himself. See, in the kingdom to which we belong, we have our citizenship in heaven. See, Jesus is the center of the focus. The, the one whom our allegiance is given. The kingdom operates according to his decrees, his laws, the kind of king he is, the, the kind of character he has. This dictates the character of the entire kingdom. But on the contrary, if we look back at Philippians 3, in 18 and 19, we'll see the character of the prince of this world in those who are his subjects. Listen, Philippians 3 and 18, it says, for as I have often told you before, I now say it again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is in their stomach. Their glory is in their shame and their mind is on earthly things. So, so let us look at these characteristics of, of, of the kingdom of this world. First, Paul says it's so tragic that this truth that Paul wrote, he says, while he was weeping, that, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, we live in a day where it has become ammunition for a lawsuit to offend someone by speaking the truth. Society has found a new way to communicate peaceably, neutrally, to avoid all conflict and challenge. And they have dubbed this way of talking political correctness. Yeah. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I, I, I'm going to be in gross violation of political correct, correctness when I say that all unbelievers, no matter how nice they are, no matter how noble, courageous, religious they are, no matter their status in society, no matter their level of giving to charitable causes, no matter how good looking they may be, no matter how influential they are by, by the virtue of their fame or their wealth or their position, all who have not believed in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for salvation and his resurrection from the dead to give them eternal life are enemies of the cross. Did you hear that? All who have not believed 
in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for salvation and his resurrection from the dead to give them eternal life are enemies of the cross. Some of them say, oh, I believe in God. I, I believe in Jesus. I read the Bible. And I have nothing against Christians, but the church, uh, that's not for me. Or something familiar, they'll say things like this. I hold Jesus in real high regard. And I have only the utmost respect for God. And I pray to God all the time. And I'm trying to live the best I can. Because I know God is watching. Remember, they can say whatever they want. But by definition, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. God became man out of his great love for us, even while we were enemies. He went to a Roman cross of execution and hung there and poured out his blood and died even while we were enemies. The only way to be pleasing to God, the only way to be right with God, the only way that your passport will be marked citizens of heaven is by being an ally of the cross of Christ. And not only a friend, but a servant. The cross of Christ is the key that opened the gates of heaven for all who believe and all who have not believed. No matter what they say, they remain enemies of the cross of Christ. And as a result of this first and fundamental characteristic, these other characteristics follow. Paul says their destruction, their, their end is destruction. No way to sugarcoat it and no need to. Their end is destruction despite all of the things that they have accomplished and amassed. For it is very clear the fate of the enemies of the cross is found in Matthew 7 and 21. Hear these words. He says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But but only he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doer. I, I, I want to introduce uh, a thought that, that I'm going to get more in depth in months to come in some sermon material. But I want you to write this down. Exodus, exile, emancipation. Exodus, exile, emancipation. See, that's the Bible broken down in three words. God provided Exodus from captivity to claim his people. The, the wayward actions of the people caused exile and in captivity, the, uh, Jesus came then to provide emancipation once and for, for all for, from sin and this world, regardless of your physical circumstances. Many have chosen to stay in exile while putting on a front that they are emancipated. But, but exodus and, and exile are physical in nature, but the last emancipation is spiritual in nature. So it is possible to still be in exile while pretending to be emancipated because we have not been spiritually delivered from exile by the cross of Jesus. This is what the Matthew 7 text that I read is talking about. It's not, it's not about what you do, but it's who you are, the state of your state of being, your mindset, your heart set. You and you can fake it. But, you know, if you're faking it and it's uh, you, you know, if you're faking it or not, when it comes time to present yourself. Too many are trying to get to heaven with a fake ID, a phony passport. You better check your passport and see if it's signed by the blood of the lamb. Number three, their God is in their stomach. That is, their God is their appetite. Their, their God is their sensuality. 
their desire for physical pleasures of this world. Physical and material gratification is their God. They, they, they center their, their, their lives around possessions and property, food and appetite, position and success, pleasure and sex, acceptance and, and social standing, money and even wealth. Just take a moment and think how some center and focus their lives upon such things. Some persons spend more time in front of a mirror or eating or, or thinking about acceptance or success and possessions or some business deal than they do in prayer. You see, the point is this. When a person has an insatiable craving and appetite for such things, those things become their God. And their cravings can, can consume their thoughts, their energy, and even their effort. And before long, the craving is taking up so much of their, in, their energy that the person has very little, if any, time for God or anything or anyone else. The appetite and cravings, or as the scripture says, his stomach becomes his God. Number four, he says, Paul says, that their glory is their shame. This simply means that they boast in their sins for glory. This characteristic that, that Paul brings out is very interesting because it, it, it's just so true. Those whom he speaks of, they try to lift up what they are doing in such a way to give the act and themselves glory. You ever heard someone talking about how, how drunk they got as if it was a badge of honor? Boy, I got so high. I forgot my name or, or we kicked it so hard. I don't even remember the last 12 hours or, or the, 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 they, they glory in their sexual conquests. They brag about their cars and homes and, and want you to know how much they cost and see their glories in their shame because it's done because they have no fulfillment for their soul in God. They are still in exile and have not yet taken hold of emancipation. Number five, they, they set their minds on earthly things. Their, their concentrations, their energies, their goals, their, their desires, all are set like fence posts in concrete on fleshly pleasures and earthly things. And, and let me make a point here that, that, that worldly things also include commendable things that are accepted by society, such as uh, Religions and spiritual pursuits, self-development programs, the pursuit of ambition, success, employment, jobs, business. Don't get me wrong. Such things are commendable and some are even necessary for survival and help. But the point scripture is making here is that the basis of our lives must be the cross of Christ, not the things of this world. And the only hope for conquering the ills and corruption of society and evil and eternal death of man is the cross of Christ. Nothing on earth, no matter how good and how beneficial it is, can give us life, not abundant life, not eternal life. Only Jesus can give us the life that conquers all and, 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 and infuses us with that, the life that lasts forever. Therefore, the focus of our lives must be Christ and his cross. Yes, we must give our attention to jobs and families and, and to other uh, good things and beneficial pursuits of life. But the foundation of everything we do must be Christ and his cross. Jesus and his cross must be the consuming passion and purpose for our lives. Listen, everything, every relationship, every pursuit will have meaning and purpose, and we will be better when the cross of Christ is our foundation. Now, the, the second characteristic uh, of this kingdom that di differentiates it from the kingdom of this world is that there is a different government in the kingdom of heaven. It's under a different kind of law. Throughout chapter six in the book of Romans that we studied earlier this year, Paul presses the point home that, that where the believer was once a slave of sin, 
He's now freed from that bondage where he once yielded his, the members of his body as instruments of unrighteousness. Now he presents himself to a new king as one who is alive from the dead and yields his, his members now as instruments of righteousness. We are now, uh, we are now as Roman 12 points out, to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service or our logical response to our new freedom. People often talk about a free will, having a free will and being free agents to make our own decisions. But this is not so. Outside of Christ, we are not free. We're slaves to sin. We're slaves to Satan and live in obedience to sin and Satan, whether we recognize Satan or not. But as citizens of heaven, we are free from the prison of sin. We are now slaves to righteousness, bond servants of, of love and righteousness. Citizens of heaven are aware of a different kind of law, a different kind of liberty. They look back on the, the law they, they slaved under before they knew Christ. And they can see that this life, that life that they left is no longer for them. Things that, that, that the enemies of the cross do, priorities they hold to, philosophies that govern their actions and reactions no longer have any power over the citizens of heaven. And they, they, they lose their appeal. The citizen of heaven is free from the law and sin of, of death and dwells securely under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Third characteristic of this kingdom to which we are citizens is that we are entitled to different rights and different privileges. As citizens of heaven, we're entitled to do certain things that citizens of this world cannot do. We have free and constant access to the king. In fact, we're encouraged to go there and find audience with him. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. In Hebrews 4 and 16, we are citizens of a kingdom ruled by a king who wants our fellowship. Our king is greatly concerned about us and is quick to confess that he knows us. He calls us friends. He counts the hairs on our head. Nothing can happen to us without him knowing about it or allowing it. Whenever we find ourselves in whatever circumstances here on earth, he is with us and we have audience with the king. In Psalm 61 and 2, it says, from the ends of the earth, I will call you. I, I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. See, our king hears our faintest cry from the furthest corners of the globe because we are his citizens and entitled to 24-7 access to the throne. No valley is, is so deep that God's love cannot, is not deeper still. We have the right to pray. Did you hear that? We have the right to pray. We have the right acting uh, as his ambassadors to introduce anyone we, we want to the kingdom as and, and usher them into equal citizenship with our own. We don't have to ask God first. Our, our guest doesn't have to take a test or get shots or, or meet some other requirement first, other than laying their sin at the foot of the cross as they pass into to, to life with Christ. What a privilege we have to do that. Now, if we stop to consider the characteristics of the heavenly kingdom uh, to which we belong. Our king, his government of love, the rich blessing uh, of our rights and privileges as citizens uh, of that kingdom. Then, then we can more uh, 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 acutely share the joy Paul must have felt 
when he penned these words, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it is sad that so many Christians go for years living as though they're second class citizens of heaven. They, they live and think that, 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 that somehow they're just barely acceptable to God. And as long as they, they, they toe to the line and, and keep most of the commandments, they, they seem to be operating with the belief that their position before God is tentative citizenship. That they have purchased with their own good works, but it's going to expire at some point if they don't continue to renew their citizenship by doing more stuff. But Jesus said to the believer that you're born from above. In fact, he, he, he says it's the only way to see the kingdom of heaven. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Paul said by the, by the Holy Spirit that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. And, and, and the, at the moment of our salvation, there is a death and a resurrection. We die to sin and to self and the kingdom of this world and are immediately given new life by the Holy Spirit. Not a renovation, but a regeneration. Did you hear that? Not a renovation, but a regeneration. Not a makeover, but a making new. When our passport is upgraded and our citizenship is heaven, we now have diplomatic immunity in this world. Did you hear that? Diplomatic immunity in this world. What does that mean? It means that we don't operate under the same consequences of those of this world. Romans 8 and 1, write this down. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Well, let me say it like this. Ridicule me, talk about me, ostracize me, oppress me, abuse me, but I don't have to wake up every morning to a tear-soaked pillow with no hope and no joy because I serve a God that wipes tears from my eyes and produces in me a joy that does not come from the world. I don't have to fall to pieces when I lose my job because I serve a God that has provided and is providing and will provide for all of my needs. My heavenly citizenship handbook tells me that if God takes care of the birds of the air, I have nothing to worry about. I don't have to fall to pieces when I get a bad report from the doctor telling me that my prognosis doesn't look good because I serve a God that raised the dead. I serve a God that gave his son Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection has promised me a glorified body when this one goes back to the dust and he has promised that he is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle and my passport says that I am a part of that church because it's marked citizens of heaven. I don't have to worry and stress over these small and trivial things that easily upsets others. Why? Because I'm on my way back home to heaven. That's my hallelujah. I'm on my way to heaven. What does your passport say this morning? It's a fair question and one that must be answered if we are to be successful and victorious in this life. Amen and bless God. I want to thank you for tuning in today and worshiping with us from all over the world with our study this morning. I pray that your week will be walked boldly in the Lord. I also pray that you would, would, would make one of our midweek Bible studies or our Sunday school a lifestyle. Please join one of them by contacting me at pastorportis at gmail.com. Thank you for continuing to fulfill your responsibility and send in your financial support for this ministry. Again, we may not be meeting in person, but there is definitely ministry going on all over this community as we provide resources to this community and care for the children of this community. If you've not taken advantage of our online giving, please do so by logging into our website, uh, thirdchurchstl.org and follow the online giving prompts. 
You can also continue to mail in your checks or drop them by the church. Uh, for those who have been faithful doing that, I say thank you. Children's ministry will begin at 11. And I want to thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. Thank you for allowing Veronica and I to share our gifts with you as we lead you and follow God. We're going to end our worship service today in song. God bless you and God keep you.